Um, we have some questions online, but I'll start if, if anyone has a quick question already, they can start in the audience. We have about 25 minutes just for questions, discussion, whatever you feel like if it's relevant to the talk. There's a question there. Uh, thanks. Great talk, everybody. Um, from Michael, uh, I saw that you mentioned, or at least you showed RO Crate on the slide. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the potential relationship between RO Crate and your own metadata format that you were talking about, the concept. Right. So RO Crate is, is, is one of the standards. Is this one? I hope so. Yes. Uh, RO Crate is one of the, one of the standards. And, and so the idea of RO Crate, uh, put very simply, is that you already have the data. And then you put an additional metadata file in there, and that describes the data that you have, right? So it's 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 it 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 comes with this additional uh, um, you know idea that the access is kind of solved already, and and so what this one does in addition is it comes with the uh, with the ability to describe where it is. And it, it, it can describe it in the way that Git Annex describes it. There is an identifier that says, well, this is the content, right? And it's available here and there through these and those uh, access methods. It could be any, could be any number, any type of, uh, any type of technology. Uh, there is one thing that, um, that is very nice in our crate is the, the, different, uh, the, the differentiation of uh, data entities and contextual entities. And that's also uh, taken, um, basically used here as a concept. So basically, it's just uh, putting a particular character in an identifier. That's, that's what it boils down to. But the idea is that you have, could have an R crate, and you can represent that R crate one-to-one -one in this structure, right? Because it's not changing semantics. It's only formatting in, in a way that is, that is good for processing. Because what we would want to do is we would want to uh, generate and regenerate identical Git repositories um, from that information in as many use cases as possible and as fast as possible. Great, thanks. Um, maybe one quick last thing is that um, there's a brand new format called Croissant. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's only about three weeks old. It's uh, for uh, machine learning in particular, and we're starting to implement that support for inside I, the I, 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 I didn't get the croissant. croissant. It's called Croissant from, from ML Commons on GitHub. So. Just something else for your radar. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Who could I compliment on? Um, you've mentioned maybe that there is, uh, that is described in link ML model. So there is this language to describe the models. And they are also working on translations between the models. So the point is that there will never be the model which rules them all. But if we can talk between the models and translate, it would help, right? So Michael working on something, and if it could translate into the model of crate or any other, we have a solution which scales, right? Uh, we don't put into isolation. Yeah, and, and maybe on, on top of that, the, uh, the, this link ML thing is, 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 is nice. Uh, it allows you to do things. Um, we haven't yet explored where the, the ends are of that system. Uh, but given that model, you can essentially generate also user interfaces for, for entry and, and, and all that. And, with the semantics already built in. So it's, it's like the practicality of all of it is, is basically the first and most important priority in, in, in all of that. And then we, we, what comes out of it needs to be attachable to a git blob or an annex key or something like this. That's, that's what it wants to do. Uh, we have a question. Um, from the audience that's in the chat. And it's to Joey. With regards to your talk about Git Annex and proxies, it reminded me of IPFS. Maybe there are some ideas to borrow over there. And I'll just highlight a few comments on that. It also basically sounds like a BitTorrent special remote. Uh, both implementations are distributed hash tables and then a link to the special remote for IPFS. Do you want to comment on that? Maybe? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's a good observation. I think the difference between say IPFS and this idea is that IPFS wants to be a globally uh, distributed and basically globally available distributed system, which, get, which means that it has to say, for example, use DHTs to figure out where things are, um, distributed hash tables. So 
this is something that can be used you know, very locally and can kind of scale and grow to some extent, which I don't know what the extent would be. Um, and of course, Git Annex can also talk to IPFS. It's just another special remote. But um, the, yeah, using it like this is, um, I don't think it really has ambitions to be anything like that um, because I think that that's already been well explored by IPFS, you know, and BitTorrent and things like that. And uh, it's not my area of expertise, but but I do think that growing Git Annex just a little bit in that direction seems useful. In our experience with IPFS, it just doesn't scale for speed at the moment. So it's just slow. And you need to run your own daemon, right? So sometimes you just cannot afford either of those. So if there is a lean solution, actually, Cachery from Jeremy Megland does similar. So you run your thin client, which just gives you that file, right? That's just enough. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point is speed. I mean, the idea with the proxy is the content will stream through it. If you're using IPFS, you know, you have like a local cache basically and it downloads to the local cache and then you have you can pull the content out and, and that can be slow and, you know, the proxy doesn't need to store, well, may not need to store any content that's even being uploaded to it, although if you're uploading, say, to an S3 bucket, there's kind of a little bit of a question. GitNX currently can't stream um, directly to special remotes from um, basically from incoming content stream. But I think this can be finessed somehow, but it's still something I need to figure out. Thanks. <clears throat> Any new questions? We have one there. Just uh, wait for the mic, please. Thank you. A question for Michael. In your um, last uh, slide, you mentioned about your uh, future planning. And uh, one of them was uh, using um, version metadata, if I remember. So do does that mean that versioned metadata can replace checksums, which I think played a major role in uh, data versioning? Does that mean, can you elaborate it? Uh, um. I'm trying to remember what was on the slide. So yeah. the your the, last so your last slide. Yeah. So so like one one of the things um, uh, one of the the key problems is that most of the metadata management systems they are detached from the actual data, right? So somebody creates a record that describes a data set or a file, uh, then removes it from that from from that file puts it into a system. Now that thing changes or doesn't change the original file, right? And 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 it's a very expensive process to repeat that usually. And, and so when we, when we do that in a data, a data set, right, what we're attaching metadata to is a content blob, right, that's identified by content. So when the content doesn't change, then of course the metadata doesn't necessarily change. So we wouldn't encode something like a, a version in the record that is stored. Right, because we could report it. So data lit usually does, you know, standardization on read, right? So you, you put all kinds of stuff in the data sets and then you report it in a standardized way. In this case, we would actually say it's describing this blob and that's now part of a data set at a particular version. And that might that version might be far more advanced than it was at the time when the metadata was created. Right? And and so it's that, that, I think that's what I meant on, on that slide as version metadata. The, the, there's no change to the actual principle, right? So the, um, what, what this record is doing is it's basically making it possible to basically use Git's way of describing things with SHASM identifiers also in the metadata records, right? So a version of a data set is a commit of a Git repository. Right? And that commit of a Git repository links to a particular tree, right? And that tree in the metadata world is a distribution of that version of that data set, right? And it's composed of other distribution of smaller pieces, which are you know, other trees or files, right? And they all have their individual identifiers. And this just takes that model and makes it general. And you can either invent identifiers or use existing ones like the ones from Git, but there's no change to the principle. It's just the presentation that changes. Yeah, I thought maybe uh, 
I thought you meant metadata can represent the main data. So version controlling of metadata can, can be replaced of version controlling the main data. So this is something that I thought about. Yeah, you, you could do that, but, uh, but there's no mandate to do that, right? If you have a file stored somewhere, it's still a file stored somewhere. Uh, that's, that's described. There's a couple of questions there in the back. Yeah, uh, hello, uh, Philip. Um, uh, so I apologize in advance, Joey. You, you had uh, said that you're not not so interested in in uh, the rolling uh, uh, check some things, and and I'm gonna go into that really quickly because something that that uh, uh, Michael said uh, reminded me um, of of a thought I had a, a few years ago. Um, the CA sync guys introduced their way of cutting up a. Um, an image, uh, a file system image, into uh, uh, blobs in a, what we would call um, rzinkable uh, uh, blobs. Uh, so, so uh, with with a rolling release checksum, and you can can do the data duplica deduplication on it. And it had the interesting property that you could actually um, do. Uh, uh, an image of uh, of such a so, so it's it's a file system tree um, the the uh, cut up image and and uh, taking an image of a file system that contains this file system tree uh, you can actually deduplicate against the original file system tree uh, and I had thought okay this might be uh, something interesting long term. Uh, uh, to, to have as a git pack file format so so we could uh, store a backup in in boop uh, or, or borg uh, i forgot which is which is <laughs> and and uh, and and if if we happen to take a backup of that backup we would still be able to deduplicate and um so from the point of view uh, of of long term Usability of that data archivability. Do you think we we um, should uh, specifically you, Michael? Do you think we should should um, go to the Git fundamentals and and try to to change that around also um, to to have a system that's that's more uh, sturdy long term, for lack of a better word. Sorry if that question doesn't make any sense. No, I. I mean, I think you're getting at some interesting things. I'm not sure I understand all of it, but I, I know, so Git Annex does, of course, deduplicate um, on the file level. Um, but I think you were talking about storing the Git repository in something like, say, in, in some kind of a rolling um, a rolling checksum-based system. So is that the basic idea so you can, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So. so uh, if if I can can store all the data in in Git in an efficient way, then I can can also use Git Annex as a layer on top of that. But say okay, uh, 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 sorry, I'm missing the word. Uh, hand over the 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 duty of actually storing this uh, not to a standard file system, but but to a Borg backend uh, that can actually use the same Git store once more. So uh, th this might be uh, not, not the typical use case we have nowadays, but, but I, I feel like if, if, we want, if we want the systems to converge somewhat uh, in the long term so, so that uh, this is more usable as a long term archival uh, format, then that, that might be an idea, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. But personally, I think the like the what you're talking about is essentially the container, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the the number of containers is relatively low in comparison to uh, the stuff that people put in containers, right? So if we're if we're thinking longevity and 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 accessibility of of data, then it, I would probably be more worried about the content. So in 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 the in the work that we do, it's the there's basically the assumption that there, there are means to store some content somewhere. And whether that's in, in a system like you describe it or in another system uh, doesn't matter. But 
but somehow we need to be able to express whatever the situation is, plus metadata that is not contained in that file blob in some intelligible way, ideally in the way that is intelligible in 30 years. And, and, and so the, the, the container file format, in, in some sense, is one aspect of the problem, but I, 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 I feel it's not the most challenging one. Um, I, I wanted to say just a little bit about um, you know, future-proofing, because this is also something that I've, you know, I, I made a page on the Gdanix website a long time ago. Um, I think it was called, um, oh, I don't know, but it's, it's um, how to access your data in your Gdanix repository when you can't run Gdanix anymore um, in X number of years. And, um, and users have actually kindly helped me extend it so it even covers cases like um, um, encrypted data that is split into chunks and things like this. So you, how to get these how to get these blobs and put them back together and get your actual file out if you know the encryption key still. Um, and I think this is a really important part of what Michael's working on. Um, you know, it feels crucial. Um, anyway, I just wanted you know it's not really addressed to your question per se, but I also wanted to say that. Um, you know, I have done a little bit of groundwork for using, for supporting rolling hashes in Git Annex. I've just never actually gotten all the way to something that works. Um, the sticking point for me has basically been the problem of, okay, say you have something using rolling hashes, you upload one thing to it, one object, now you're uploading some other objects to it, how do you know which objects were actually connected? Um, there, there's kind of a difficulty there that I've never quite gotten past. Um, if you think about using something like rsync, you know that you're rsyncing against the previous version of the file, so you're going to, you know, you're going to get the rolling ha checksums and get a nice, um, efficient result. But with Git Annex, it has no idea that this blob is connected to that blob, that it's like a previous version of it, and so it, it how does it find the right blob to do the deltaing against is kind of an open question in my mind that I've never figured out a solution to. So, so getting to um, general purpose rolling checksums that, that would work in any special remote, say, uh, I think needs solving that problem and maybe somebody has an idea. Thank you. Shouldn't you just marry it to Git finally? You know, because that's where you have right. that information. It comes from this commit yeah, for, that, right. for that file name, right? Yeah, um, uh, one uh, comment or question regarding the uh, future uh, proving of the data um, from, uh, from a slide from Michael's talk. Uh, I'm not sure I agree about that Git and Git Annex and Data Lad have like the same complexity of their data formats. So I would think if you have like the pro Git book and only your .git folder and like a couple of months time, your, I think you should get your data out of it and your repository, but I'm not sure about Git Annex and Data Lab because I just I don't know them that well. Um, so I think what I really like also about Git is that it's like it's not storing your data away in some crazy format and whatever like Subversion does like in this kind of like database thing and it's basically gone your data. Um, so yeah, so just a comment. I think in, in, in terms of uh, complexity added by in, in data formats, then then probably data is the is the smallest, right? Because it really doesn't have to add anything because it's already provided by Git and Git Annex. So that, that's I don't think that's a problem. But the, so the way I'm thinking about it is um, the situation to aim for or to prepare for is not that you have you know a nicely presented bare Git repository on your hard drive in 50 years, but you, you know there's an object identifier in some system, right? And you don't know which one is the data, which one is the, the metadata associated to it. If it comes in a Git repository form, what exactly is the form? And then what is, what is stored in the objects in Git, right? So uh, of course, if you have months time, then what, you, what that translates to is, what I'm looking for is really, really expensive to make it worthwhile that that search expedition, right? And and but 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 that means losing all the other stuff. 
in, in some sense. And I think the, the, the simpler the description, the less likely it is that you have to invest that much. Yeah, um, one of the things that really struck me about your idea is that you do need some kind of description of how Git Annex works to the extent that it can be reproduced, or you know, you can work backwards from the data that you have to get to the Git Annex repository or something like it that's enough like it to use. So that's really interesting to me because I do, you know, I have, you can read the Git documentation and like you said, re Git fairly easily or enough of it to pull a file out. Um, and you can read the Git Annex documentation and do the same thing, but we don't have, you know, there's nothing machine readable and it's not a standard per se, it's just a simple description of here's the things. So I'm really interested to know what you're coming up with as yeah. far as that layer. Yeah. So the, the way I'm thinking about this is, is to not think about it because the, 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 the I, I totally skipped over it, but um, in, in, in some sense, um, the, uh, there's an example on that website that shows you how to describe how, how you would describe that something is accessible through Git Annex Mesh Remote, right? And that of course assumes that you know what that is and you, you know how to make it run, right? But ultimately, um, there's also there's also the trust where you put the data, right? And if you if you are an institution or an individual and you're aiming to deposit something uh, with a lifetime of half a century or an entire century, right? You you will aim for the least complexity possible, right? And you would go for something where that thing is, you know, immediately available through some means that are the simplest possible that you can think of at the time, right? And the entire point of, 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 of this distributed world is that these dis decisions, they change all the time, right? So today, uh, I would put something um, that is somewhere where it's accessible through Git Annex Special Remote because I'm working with this thing, right? I have an expectation that the file materializes within the foreseeable future on my drive because I need to compute on it, right? If I'm depositing something in a library, I'm willing to wait for a week, right? If it's if it's if the tape robot needs to be, you know, migrated back into the building, right? But it, but it. So, so these things change, and then also the way you describe them change, and then they become simpler because the means to get there, uh, in, in terms of identifiers, become simpler if you are aiming for preservation. But you don't know, at, when you're working with the data set, you don't know that you're aiming for preservation because you're, you cannot aim for that level of you know, thinking ahead for every single file that you deal with, right? You, you would want to apply that to the selected few that you really care about. And maybe that decision, who are the selected few files, or what are the selected few files, is not done by the original author, but by a librarian. So they just watch what's being used and what's, you know, what has dependencies to something else, and then they move that to a system that is, can better deal with the future. Um, I could argue even that Git is much more complex than Git Annex. Because when you go to .git, right, it's like there is objects, they could be packed as well. It's like there is some magic happening. You can check out Git Annex branch, and then you'll see everything, right? So it has all the information about special remotes. It has for every key simple files, which you look inside, oh, this is URL, this is the list of few IDs. And after you understand the basic model, not how it works, but basic model, you can kind of get trust that, okay, later on, you know, maybe it would be a different tool. Now we'll present maybe about their JavaScript support for Git Annex, right? So when tools build up on top of the model, it gives more trust, I would say. Um, yeah, that should be the last question before we continue okay, with the program. Uh, I'll try to make it a short one. Uh, hi, I'm Lucas. Thank you for your presentations. So I have a question about the storage cost of keeping version blobs. So uh, imagine I have a one gigabyte file and I rewrite the first byte of it and then commit again. So how much space will it take uh, to, uh, in the, of course, in the data storage part of Git Annex, not, not Git? I could start and then we pass on. Um, you could, first of all, use technologies which would help you underneath. You could use file system, which would deduplicate at the level of blocks, right? Yes, and yes, so of, of there course. there is a level but, of solutions, and then... But, but we start, uh, I want to start with, to understand how 
uh, Gidanex works, yeah. then of course there is overcoming the uh, understanding how to handle your changing data, not to kill Git Annex with it, yeah. but then, yeah. Yeah, so the simple question, or the simple answer is you have a one gigab you have two one gigabyte files, mm -hmm. versions, it takes two gigabytes, and yeah, that's so, obviously. So there's, there's no yeah. kind of uh, right. trying to. So the reason that there isn't, um, first of all, Git Annex is a local repository, and you want to be able to access the files. So if you're using some complicated you know, deduplicating technology, you still have to pull the file out and store it on your disk to, to access it. So you still have two copies of the file then. Um, even if you've, you know, even if, the, even if one of them represents two of them, you have to pull it back out to access it. So Git Annex pr prefers to just keep things simple and have one object per file, one file. Uh, but of course then you can move it to a special remote, um, which happens to support deduplication and then problem solved, as long as you're only using one cop one version locally, say the most recent version, then you only keep the one copy of it locally and you keep the rest you know, in some kind of a storage system that can deal with this, which I think is really the only way that this can work at this level. There has to be some other place that handles the deduplication. It can't be in the local Git repository. And I, I just want to emphasize one thing, uh, also from the longevity perspective, the, the, the the consequence of Git Annex doing that means that the, the, the interface that we can develop code against that works with the content of these repositories is essentially the POSIX file system, right? So I read a file, and we know that we can read files since several decades, and we have some hope that we can read files a few decades into the future, right? If it would start doing something fancy, then we would inherent, inherit that fancy as a liability also. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.